Um, welcome to the University of the West of Scotland. Um, my name is uh, Professor Paul Martin. I'm the Deputy Principal and Deputy Vice Chancellor here at the University. It's a great pleasure to see such a wide ranging uh, turnout. Um, we'll just be watching Ross's expenses to see who he's paid what to be here this evening. <laughs> um, that said, it's always a brilliant um, event and experience in a university when one of our academic colleagues uh, launches uh, their publications, launches a book uh, here and chooses UWS as a venue for that. Um, so it's great to have all of you here uh, this evening. Um, I'm not going to talk about the gist of the, the book. Um, I'm, I'm a bit perturbed that my name isn't on as a co-author in terms of my depth of understanding of the subject. Um, <laughs> we've just got two kids, do um, in, in that sense, um, uh, Ross uh, is known to all of you and to us, in, in, indeed internationally, for his interest in these particularly challenging and difficult uh, subject areas. Uh, publishing across a range of very, very complex and very sensitive areas from a societal perspective, asking us questions collectively about what we think and how we would position and, and challenging us about our values ourselves. Now, that's really important in an academic environment where we are nurturing uh, the workforce of the future in these kind of uh, uh, tricky and complex areas. And particularly when we're looking at uh, developing people that are influencing policy and practice in the area of working with uh, children at, or young people at the margins of society. I do have to pay, put forward apologies prof from Professor Bhopal, who uh, is unwell. Um, and just uh, last evening, we were in emails um, uh, apologising. She's just not able to be here. She was uh, keen to be here this evening. Um, uh, obviously, it was a joint lunch between Ross and and. Uh, so uh, it's difficult from that perspective for her. Um, we've got a range of speakers this evening, short, uh, sharp presentations. That's just a subtle uh, instruction to those that are presenting. Um, uh, and uh, plenty of time for questions uh, and also for general kind of milling around networking and discussion um, at, the, at the end. And you'll find within the audience a range of UWS academic colleagues as well. Um, so again, please make yourself known to them and they will to you um, and see what kind of support we can give. This, this book in particular is relevant to UWS because it links across our work in sociology, in criminology, in uh, youth studies and, and, and young people, in public sector governance, in politics and in <coughs> policy making. So it's one of these books that I'm sure um, Ross was thinking about that in terms of the number of copies he would order for the library. Um, but it's one of these books that would be attached to and referred to across a number of our programs at UWS. So it's a great pleasure for you to ask me to welcome uh, colleagues and, and guests this evening, Ross. And thank you very much for your work and dedication in this area. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul, for that uh, very nice introduction, and thanks for taking time uh, of your busy schedule to come along this evening and welcome uh, the guests to this event. So uh, I would just like to also welcome you now uh, on behalf of Palbreed Macmillan, our publishers, uh, and also on behalf of my co-author, Kawan Bhopal, who unfortunately wasn't able uh, to be here this evening due to illness, and I know she's gutted uh, at not being able to to come along. Um, but just to welcome you and just to see it's always an enormous pleasure to see so many people um, from different parts of my life come along to these events um, that in your own unique way uh, you have contributed to it uh, by supporting me uh, as family members, as friends, as colleagues and also it's great to have um, some of our participants from the research um, here this evening as well that are going to speak uh, later on. But events of these kinds don't take place uh, without a lot of support um, from uh, a lot of people behind the scenes. And I would just like to thank first and foremost Jane Caffrey. Um, she's hiding me at the back here. Um, but Jane has been an enormous 
a source of support in organizing everything from the catering, the posters, setting up the um, uh, the, 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 the chairs even, and uh, everything else, and uh, taking care of all the, the, the backroom uh, details. And uh, so thanks very much, Jane, and I've got a wee gift here uh, for you. Uh, I thought we'd do that right at the beginning, otherwise I might forget. So if you could come forward. And also to uh, the events team as well that have helped us with this event, sending out regular tweets and setting up the book display, etc. And um, also for uh, the catering team here at Paisley for putting on the, the food and drink that you're going to hopefully enjoy uh, later on. And to Palgrave Macmillan themselves and Stephanie Carey, uh, who was our main contact there in the criminology division, for all the support that she's given us and um, for encouraging us to be somewhat creative in our choice of cover uh, for this book. We weren't quite convinced at first when we heard uh, the, the idea it might be a bright yellow cover, uh, but I think when we saw it in the flesh, we were immediately convinced uh, that I think the distinctive colour and design uh, will really help to attract attention uh, in, the years to, in the years to come. And uh, finally, to <coughs> Professor Shad Maruna uh, from the University of Manchester, who has written a very eloquent uh, foreword uh, to the book and really endorsing uh, the content of it. We were really privileged uh, to have him uh, do that for us. And also to John Muncy from the Open University for a second endorsement on the back cover uh, of the book. Um, so I think those are all the thank yous, although I do have one or two others uh, that I'll keep to the end. And just before we go any further, um, I just need to go through a couple of housekeeping arrangements with you. Uh, toilets are just outside the door, straight across the corridor. And if there is a fire alarm this evening, then it is for real folks. <laughs> um, so we do have to uh, exit the building, and uh, the nearest exit is just near left hand side when you go out the same way as most of you came in. Okay, so um, I think it's fair to say that um, Calwant and I, uh, in our uh, different ways and different contexts, have probably spent the majority of our <coughs> academic research careers focusing on exploring how the processes of marginalisation and exclusion operate in the lives of young people and particularly disadvantaged young people. <coughs> Those who are socially disadvantaged uh, because of poverty, growing up against the backdrop of social deprivation, difficult, difficult and, and challenging home lives, and those uh, that come from ethnic minority backgrounds who often unfortunately are disadvantaged as well uh, because of their cultural backgrounds. And uh, in the first chapter in the book we make the point that over the last two decades in particular public social and public policy in this country has very much focused <coughs> on the deficits or the perceived deficits associated with young people focusing on their challenges, their problems, their deficiencies, uh, rather than focusing on their strengths and their assets. And unfortunately, that has filtered through into many of the experiences that young people have on an everyday basis. And across the pages of this book, uh, what Calwant and I have done is to bring for the first time <coughs> our collective experiences and insights together. Most of Calwant's work has been done um, south of the border uh, with young people, predominantly in the education system, and the majority of my work done north of the border um, uh, with young people who are in the criminal justice system or perhaps have had experiences with policing um, or perhaps even experiences of um, being referred into the adult system too early, which ultimately has had criminogenic uh, effects on them uh, later on. And so we focus on some of the challenges that young people come across, uh, but there is also a message of hope in the second half of the book as well. 
uh, where we shed light on the very positive illustrations of practice that there are in here, where practitioners like lots of you here this evening are very much involved in reversing those processes of social uh, exclusion <coughs> and engaging in pioneering forms of intervention and collaboration uh, that break down those entrenched processes uh, of oppression and exclusion, enabling young people to feel socially included again and enabling uh, equity and social justice uh, to prevail. And so as well as drawing attention to the challenges and the problems and the demonisation of young people, uh, we also draw attention to the really positive practice that there is out there. And anyone who knows anything about the work that I've done in the past and also the work that Calwant does will know that one of the things that we do tend to do is always strive to prioritise the voices of our research participants, particularly the most disadvantaged, vulnerable and marginalised young people uh, in society. And I'm delighted to say that this event this evening is no exception to that way of working. And so we do have um, some young people's voices uh, that you'll hear uh, that we've worked with in the past. You'll hear the voices of the practitioners uh, that we've worked with as part of this book. Uh, who will talk a little bit about uh, their very positive um, uh, interventions that they're involved in. And so I was conscious uh, this evening that I didn't want um, this to be all about my voice. Um, and so I'm delighted that um, um, we have some really interesting people here uh, to talk. And in the early part of the book, we focus predominantly on Calwan's work uh, with uh, black and minority ethnic young people and uh, their experiences in the education system where they're often disadvantaged and marginalised and subjected to quite discriminatory uh, treatment in, in lots of contexts. And we also focus on their experiences in the labour market where often they are judged on the basis of uh, their culture and their ethnicity instead of on the basis of their qualifications and their experiences. And I'm delighted to be able to welcome to the floor now one of the, the real pleasures that I have uh, from this job is being involved in nurturing and supporting the future generation of academics. And uh, one of uh, those uh, young academics is Dr. Naget Riaz, who is here this evening. Uh, Naget was one of my own PhD students and she graduated in the summer uh, with her doctorate. And she has been uh, very much involved in working with black and minority ethnic young people here in Scotland. And I think her thesis illustrates um, many of the themes that we have also uncovered uh, through our own work. And she's going to talk a little bit about her research and then introduce the first of our speakers this evening from uh, the practice to me. Welcome to the game. <laughs> That was some uh, introduction, Ross Young. Um, you're my grandmother, but thank you so much for that. <laughs> you're still young. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh, my thesis explored the construction of black and minority ethnic young people who've been labelled through policy um, by their schools and agencies as acquiring more choices, more chances, which is, to, in layman's terms, additional support as they begin their transition from compulsory education onto further education, employment, or training. Uh, as Ross mentioned, youth policy in Scotland is underpinned by the philosophy of social justice, equality and equity. And there is a guarantee by policy, such as getting it right for every child, uh, of receiving the full opportunity to fulfil their potential at school, where their priority is to engage with young people to facilitate their personal, social and educational development, and enable them to gain a voice, influence and a place in society. And this is from a Scottish Government report, 2004, page one. Information on ethnic minorities has been collected by schools and local councils um, across the country, particularly in Glasgow since 1989, where it's been used to, um, used to allocate resources and to plan classes. Yet literature and policy it continues to highlight certain BME young people as at risk of a poorer educational attainment and also having a higher risk 
of falling out of education, employment, and training. This research was an opportunity for me to explore the journeys of young people as they transitioned out of compulsory education, and indeed, if the policy actually met the needs of the young people through discussions with teachers, youth workers, and the young people. Um, I came to a variety of conclusions, but the main one was that currently, the youth policies in this very small scale study have been poorly written by policymakers, poorly understood by local government, school, and affiliated agencies. And therefore, therefore, they've been poorly interpreted and, Im and implemented within those um, within those environments. Because when they were enacted in schools, it resulted in the needs of the very young people that needed that support. Um, their needs were not met, and it became a superficial exercise in my my research to get to gather statistical data to form school leave a destination reports rather than making real change happen to empower the young people. The findings actually highlighted that the young people, they're not, they're not listened to, they don't feel valued and they feel powerless and they have a very weak sense of belonging uh, with their schools and as Ross said, they are discriminated against. Youth policy in my, in my study, it needs to reflect the young people's voices, where they are listened to, and where issues of belonging and feelings of powerlessness are addressed. In today's current climate of increasing surveillance, the tracking and monitoring of young people until they are 24 years old, under the guise of youth policy, ensuring that they are economically viable and are contributing to make Scotland successful, comes under question. By creating a stereotype of disengaged young person, which has been evidenced by literature and practice, are we contributing to the construction of ethnic minority Muslim young people who are perceived as requiring support, or are they being constructed as an economic burden on the state, resulting in further demonization by the media and policy, and polarized further to the margins, akin to the labeling of the underclass or feral youth, through a neoliberal discourse. The implementation of the prevent strategy in schools and surveillance agenda may create further division, fear and fracturing of identity and the sense of belonging of the young people and move the policy from the creation of a profile of a young person labeled as needing additional support in schools to a young person labeled as a potential extremist. I look forward to reading Cole Want and Ross's book to continue to examine the control and contr examine state control and young people. And thank you, Ross, for this opportunity to say a few words. Moving on, I'm delighted to welcome Brother Raza Sadiq um, to our event this evening. Brother Raza has been recognised on many fronts for the voluntary work he does for the young people in Govan Hill, and has won many awards over the decades. One or two, Brother Rosa. I'm not quite sure, but more than one, I think, yes. I think you've been in double figures. Double figures now, <laughs> well done. Um, Govan Hill is one of the two most ethnically diverse diverse wards in, in Scotland, and indeed Glasgow. It's also a ward that's listed very high on the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, where poor housing and poverty is prominent. Active Life Club is a youth club which offers programs from sports to public speaking to working to working alongside researchers. Um, so the voices and the needs of the young people are at the centre and forefront of the organisation, whether it's decisions, planning or delivery of how the group is run and how they wish to be perceived. This would not have been possible without the support and dedication, dedication of Brother Reza and the youth workers into instilling into the young people that what they say matters, it is significant, it has value, and therefore the young people have value. We approached Active Life Club a few weeks ago and they have very kindly offered to put together a short video for today's book launch. And on that note, I would like to ask Brother Rosa to come up uh, in front and um, say a few words. Thank you. <laughs> Social equality at school and the uh, treatment by the peers, colleagues, teachers. Do, do you think there's a progress? Yes, progress on Facebook. 
some things that just go there. When you do it, other things that make them go. Emotionally as well. And teachers, you go do it. Well, the thing that I think is what the game is going to do. Yeah. That you'll be happy to meet. You think that affects your confidence? Yeah, it's cool. That's something I didn't get. I should say that you should be more involved in the community thing. So, does that mean like you get involved in a lot of um, festivals? It's just like the kids are looking at them from the different parts of your But police, police should have more of a... The way I look at it is um, especially within the young Asian community, when police are coming around or when you see police on the street, there's a kind of sense of fear. Yeah. There's definitely a sense of fear as well. Do you know what? These kids are going to, they're here to make a face, stop me, and don't want to speak to me. They're wanting to do something to me. They want to, to affect that? That, that, that's, that's what I'm saying. We need, to, we, need, we need to like explain why this is, and also we need to kind of like um, try to do something to stop this. Um, because you shouldn't really have that fear of the police. The police are there to help you, support you. If you're in trouble, they should be the ones there that you should look up to. However, if you're like kind of panicking or getting that kind of like heartbeat stop, once you see a policeman, there's something not right there. So there is some, there is more. I think that this could do. They could integrate more of our youths, whether it be through clubs, through tournaments, festivals. We've also been part of a club like ELC. Actually, what we do it does have a lot of confidence building elements to it, a lot of teamworking building elements to it, and also there are occasions, there are events that we do hold with the police and. Um, Kind of like resolve social injustices that some of us go through as an opportunity for some of us to speak up and uh, be heard. In these kind of situations, I do think that it does help the youth more so than it does lead them astray. Um, I've seen it happen. You've seen the kids that have come through the clubs. Um, they came in, they were a little bit misbehaving and whatnot. However, through the clubs, they've kind of like worked their way up. They've seen the good that the club does for them, so they decide to give back to the club as well. And it is, it's like a kind of like circle, like a circle of life, you know what I mean? You put, you put the work in, you get it back as well. You can also see from the name of the side of the team, you see this one from this, and how to build up on things. And the film itself too, like, from a future, for example, we call it pause interviews or job interviews, anything like that. That actually help me out. If we should have more activities like this kind of stuff happening in the weekends or reading after the days so that we keep the kids busy so they are doing something, something for themselves. Should do these kids to basically empower our future without the right direction and training and facilities and environment? Indeed. <coughs> <laughs> this was quite a difficult task, by the way, to create this video because in a short space of time and the young people are shy and the venue we had was quite difficult to capture all the sound and the, the, the creative person we have in our team, Lareb, sitting there. So that was hard work to get something out of, no <laughs> which, was, which was good. but. Obviously, my name is Raza Sadiq and Sister Nigrit has introduced very kindly a very active life in me and uh, for around about 20 years and active life was set up when I was in Glasgow Uni studying my community development and learning course and instead of writing and making stories that tell like create something and this is how it started and started with no vision. We always say we need to have a great vision. There was hardly any vision. Let's set up something and start playing. This is how we started. And I'm currently a chairperson as well for Active Life, but 75% young people are on the committee at the moment. And they are all under 25. So that's the basically Active Life is what it says on the train, empowering young people through sports. The sports we use as a medium. and. I'm sure many academics and practitioners sitting here and you will agree sports is a, a great way to engage with young people and some of your findings definitely they will highlight those achievements. And round about we've got a weekly programs and we used to do our program on a voluntary basis now having staff for 18 years and when I started I was very young 
you can see how you grow old when you're working <laughs> in a youth setting, and you go gray very quickly. But it's a very rewarding working full time. But most of my work is in the sector by the training, education, employment. I will not be mentioning my employer before. If I do, I might get sacked very quickly. So <laughs> I will I will keep them on the side. But what I say or anything I say will be coming from active life and you know, on a voluntary capacity. And I, I have seen young people, what your research is saying, physically seen being discriminated, demonized, targeted, school, not really supporting them. If they complain, they are seen as a problem, they are labeled, because once they are labeled, then they need to prove to school, yes, I am a problem. <coughs> and they will act like, and then whole school will know, and they will be very quickly expelled. And I've dealt with so many. When it comes to training options, you will see everywhere under representation, and nobody's looking into it. The blame is going towards ethnic minority young people, or they don't really choose training because they're going to higher education. That's another catch now with the policy makers and the service providers. <coughs> but when they're going to higher education, they're staying unemployed longer than anybody else. So that's not really balancing the, the case. If they are coming with a degrees and are unemployed, something is wrong with the system. And that system is probably racism and discrimination to stop with. Uh, I found young people, they don't really trust systems because they feel like if they've been discriminated, if you look back to their old, older generation, it's a third, fourth generation, and now they, they, they belong to this place. And they see they are Scottish, so when they go and see employers and other, and they ask them, from where you come from? Oh, come from Govan Hill? No, 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 your father? Oh, he was from Govan Hill. No, his father? No. Oh, from where you come from? Back in India and Pakistan. So these questions are still coming. <coughs> still tokenism exists, because I've been approached with so many people. Oh, we've got training, Raza, can you send one ethnic artist? So th these things are not changing, obviously. The system mentioned about SLDR and STARTS and all these things. Uh, they are numbers. The numbers, a lot of young people are achieving very well in school. So that's not the case. That's the thing of the past when they were underachieving and they need a lot of help. And being from a think minority is a penalty <coughs> and a, it's a kind of a you got discrimination, you know, in the sense of you're not going to achieve because of who you are. Or you're not supported by the families. Families are very supportive. I've seen so many families that desperate for their young people to get into careers, but they're not getting <coughs> into One of the example I can give you, probably many of you are familiar, the new policies on STEM and massive drive for underrepresentation and uh, gender gap and everything. But a lot of ethnic minorities are going into those fields, but they're not getting jobs. So that's another area to look at. It's not all about people can blame the young people because they are not really interested. I've seen young people diversifying to every career on the earth now, and they are moving out from those traps, like working in a family <coughs> or those typical retail jobs. They're moving out from it. They're moving out from those high top jobs, medicines and others, that they can see there's a potential in other areas. So that's stigma need to be removed by the professionals and encouraging young people to benefit and take part in a variety of careers. and. Islamophobia is a, a massive kind of issue for Muslim youth because they are more unemployed than any other group. And that, that's, that's really affecting in a bigger scale than mental health and other, other issues will develop. And role models, we've got a lot of role models, but they're not really given opportunity to shine through because they're not in many careers, our professions are promoting and <coughs> retention in various jobs. That's one thing I've seen. When you work in a bigger organization, you might be a token, and you might, I've been trying to improve my education. I've been through every university. Two courses I've done from UWS, a degree and a post-graduation. I've done a couple of others, but I'm still stuck on the floor. I can't even think of a ceiling. Ceiling is too high for so many ethnic minorities. And I think so that's policy needs to really challenge. Just the mentioned policies are just the policies. 
and a lot of people are keen to polish them rather than looking into how you can work together with young people. The, lastly, I will say one thing I found in my life, the very rewarding working with young people. And if you are with young people or they are with you, there's nothing you can really unturn. They've got a solution for challenges. <coughs> the organization needs to really find out how to channel their energy. And Active Life has been doing for 18 years. And we've got probably 100 plus young people every week coming from nowhere. Parents are involved, young people are involved, and I'm getting old, I'm trying to build them up. But hopefully, policymakers can look into investing in young people, and if they can invest now, they are our future. Thanks for listening. to Raza and thanks to the gate and it's great to hear um, about the, 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 the experiences of these young people that there is hope in terms of organisations like the Active Life Club and I think um, some of those illustrations you provided reflect perfectly some of the themes that we have in the early chapters of the book. So continuing uh, a tour around the book, uh, in the middle chapters uh, we begin to focus more on young people's experiences in their own communities out in the streets in Scotland, um, predominantly working class, um, socially uh, disadvantaged young people and the experiences they have with police officers. Um, and one of the points that we make in the book is the fact that in spite of the policy promises that came forward at the time that Police Scotland was formed, um, which were very much focused on community engagement, prevention, multi-agency partnership work, etc. For quite a while, unfortunately, some of those agendas were hijacked um, by a continued focus on enforcement, particularly through tactics such as stop and search. And we explored young people's experiences uh, of police officers and stop and search within chapter five of the book. We then go on to look at young people's experiences in the criminal justice system for those, for one reason or another, perhaps who have drifted into offending behaviour, normally because of um, the disadvantage they experience early in their lives. And the way in which early contact with the adult system, unfortunately, leads only to further reoffending in lots of cases, uh, rather than uh, rehabilitation and desistance. And I'd like to welcome now to the floor uh, Martin Kosh, who is the head of Mirren Park School here in Paisley. Mirren Park was one of the places where uh, we conducted interviews with young people who talked about their experiences of uh, these things that I've been referring to. And Martin's going to talk a little bit about um, some recent conversations he's been having with the pupils there. Right. Okay, thank you, Ross. Um, unfortunately, we, we had planned, or fortunately, we had planned for a couple of young people to come tonight. Uh, as the deadline loomed and we got closer and closer up to tonight, um, it just it, it was obvious it was too much for them to actually come here in person. Uh, we had thought maybe a video could have been captured, so that's the one we'd seen, but they thought uh, there's police at the event, right? We can't be seen on screen, <laughs> we seem to be disclosing anything. So, um, <laughs> I just sat down with a group of young people through the week past and we had quite a, a good series of group work, sort of discussion points based on a number of areas that, that Ross had, had, had highlighted for the young people to give their views and opinions. Um, I'll give you a quick snapshot of what Midland Park School is about. Um, certainly no point of tonight is to, to give you a flavour of some of the opinions of the young people that go to school, but we are classed as a, a small independent school. Uh, we work with young people of secondary school age um, for a variety of reasons. They have um, failed to sustain mainstream uh, education. So there isn't one type of profile of young person we've got. Um, unfortunately, I think the word stigma had been used before. Um, a lot of the young people are stigmatised. The, the, their behaviour is quite outlandish. They swear a lot. They, they don't go to classes. They might get involved in community offending. Um, yeah, we do have some young people that have been caught up in a lot of that, but we actually have a lot of vulnerable young people as well that have a lot of really challenging life circumstances. 
<laughs> getting to school was the last thing on the agenda. Um, just trying to survive day to day is the thing that's probably highest on their, their list of to do's. Having said that, I'll give you a few case studies, um, albeit anonymous, of some of the young people we've got and some of the outcomes that we're achieving in the school. But really, I want to focus on what some of the young people um, had told me through the week based on some of the themes that, that is in the book. So really, the first, the, the big question was, how, how do you get on with the police? What, what's your thoughts to the police? Now, I found I had four different groups of young people. In the first five minutes, it was all bluster. It was all, the police are this, the police are that. Let me tell you about the time where 15 cops chased me down all these back doors, etc., etc. <laughs> Once we get past all of the bluster and all the bravado, there's actually some really good pertinent points I found in it. It was a really good discussion. Everyone began to sort of take part and it became a bit serious and it became quite a positive discussion. Sometimes they're all right was a theme that's sort of going through. You know, they're, they're actually okay. When you come down to it, you know, they're actually all right. You know, and to be honest, um, if we're doing something wrong, they've got every right to come up and talk to us or challenge us. So that, that was something that was came through from all the young people. Um, they hate getting videos, apparently police hate getting videos. Um, so it's okay for them to video young people, but they hate getting video back. So that was something as well. Um, some are okay, and I think that was the theme. It depends on who's there. They felt that some police officers they had a really good relationship with, and it tended to be the ones that were in the community quite a lot. Um, don't give them a reason to deal with you if police are fine. That was another thing that a young person said. And he'd actually said to me as well, I wanted to be a police officer when I was young. Not so sure now, but maybe one day I'll, I'll go back to want to be a police officer again. So that was quite interesting. What are the experiences and opinions of the police? So what experiences have the young person had? Um, one was I've been flung about a lot. Um, there's this one police officer that always sort of grabs me and sort of throws me about. Um, they always put the cuffs on too tight. That was another one apparently, so I don't know if that's just a procedural thing for the police to take note of. Um, we get in trouble for hitting them, but it's never the other way about. So, um, okay. Uh, stop and searches was the theme then, and again it's in the book. Um, what, how often does that occur within the, the, the area that young people come from? And that was quite quite a, a, a range from all the time, basically young people are stopped and searched two or three times a week, other young people hardly ever, and uh, depending on how accurate the storytelling was for some of the young people, it varied from, it was a friendly sort of, what are you doing here, what are you up to, have you been up to anything, <coughs> maybe the police officer are using a relationship with the young person, they know them, to um, two, un, un, uh, um, two unmarked cars came, all the police officers that didn't have any uniform on, Got me in the back of a car, took me to the police station and strip searched me. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know how accurate that is. That was, that was just a scale of the, the stories that were being told. Young people's positive experiences of the police. Um, police are quite annoying, generally, uh, but the ambulance and fire brigade are all right. So um, <laughs> maybe it's a bit of PR that needs to be done there. I don't know. Um, police are good for solving crimes, um, but not for giving us grief. And that was actually a theme that came through a lot of the discussion, that if something was to happen, like a murder or a housebreak and a car gets stolen, the police are actually very good at solving crimes. We just wish they would leave us alone on the street corners and, and things like that. And that, that was quite a common theme. So we moved on to young people's experience of the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. um, not a lot of our young people had the experience of being in court. Um, more of the young people had the experience of going to the children's report, if I'm being honest. So we sort of class that <laughs> as their experience. Um, they said it was all right. It was fun but fair. It would rather not be there, but it was definitely better than getting involved with the police. So that was the sort of common theme that came through there as well. What could be done to stop the whole process um, being so discriminatory against the young people? And they sort of said just actually been allowed to have their... their feelings and their thoughts heard. Having a chance, actually, if they've done something wrong, to, to make up for it um, and sort of try and get back to being a good citizen or not making the same mistakes time and time again. That was a common theme as well. Um, we moved on to schools, and that was an interesting one for me, based on the fact that the majority of our young people haven't sustained mainstream. They've got a very, very bad experience of high school. 
Um, actually, some of their parents have got a really bad experience from mainstream uh, education as well. Um, really, the main problem, the main thing that came out from the, the 20 young people I spoke to was the relationships or lack of relationships with the teachers. And that, that was the thing that kept coming through. Um, I think we'd already said young people getting stigmatised, that their name is known, you know, that they're, they're basically going through for one or two uh, problems that they might have been involved in before. And that sort of seems to fall in about one class, a department, and then the school. Um, young people, uh, quite a few of them said there's a difference between younger teachers and older teachers. It tends to be the more positive relationships with younger teachers, which I found interesting. Um, the school could have tried harder to keep me involved, and could have tried harder. Uh, they just felt that sometimes the school gave up too easily. So that was another thing. So generally speaking, that was the main sort of themes that were covered. Um, the young people are very, um, they're very paranoid and they're, they're very sort of suspicious when you're asking for an opinion. But that's actually what we try and do in Mirren Park School, is we give them the opportunity to be involved and actually speak their mind. Um, we do that through using positive relationships. Um, all the staff lunch with the young people. Uh, we basically try and take them out of school, do activities as much as possible, just to break down the barriers of the classroom, teacher versus pupils, that sort of uh, dynamic. And it tends to work really well. Um, a lot of the issues we have in school are actually as a result of something that's happened out with the school, whether it be a community or a bit at home. Generally speaking, when young people are in the school, they're in class, they're following the programme, there isn't a lot of difficulty, there's not a lot of disruption. Um, the young person being able to express their views. We have a, a pupil council within the school, so uh, every year we pick the young people to be in that council or they, they basically volunteer themselves. Once we get past the sort of request for jacuzzis and <laughs> motor and things like that, generally speaking, a lot of their opinions are actually very good. Um, and we're trying to get to a model. There's a model in Glasgow, and I can't remember for the life of what the project is called, do you need to forgive me? But basically, it's a small charity where the young people actually run it themselves, and they've got an old, uh, their own board. I think everyone on the, the board is under 20, I think. Uh, and basically, they allocate funds to different projects within their community. That's what we're trying to get to in terms of giving young people decision-making powers, and it's completely alien to them, let me tell you. Uh, what do you think? They sort of look at you thinking, why are you asking me this? What's the catch? Um, and I think that actually is maybe something that we're seeing in terms of their involvement in the community with police, they just feel as if they're having a chance to express their feelings and it's peer pressure, it's all that. We probably know the, the sort of difficulties young people have, especially out in the communities. So basically I want to give you three quick, I can talk, right, so I'm going to try and nip this. Uh, I've got three case studies here of the typical profile of the real person that we have. One of the, the young people we'll call Stephen. Um, he's a family history of alcohol and substance uh, misuse, and he's currently living with his grandparents. Now, he, he was he was hunted out of his high school, I have to say, and uh, you know, reading the, the, the paper with all the reports, it wasn't the same person that was standing in front of me the first couple of days that he came to our school. Um, he was permanently excluded due to high levels of disruptive behaviour and violence in the school, um, and I, did, I do think he actually struck one of the staff. Okay, so. He's not a complete angel, that, that's for sure. Um, in the two years he's been with us, there's been two critical incidents, both of which is when he's just been emotionally flooded and he's not been able to cope. He's actually ran out of the school and punched the windows outside the school. Um, and it, they were attributable to things that were happening at home. We can directly link why he did it and he, he could openly express after the events. So that's not too bad for two years that, you know, Ideally, we don't want things like that to happen, but generally speaking, he's, he's done well to, to fit in the programme and attend regularly. Um, last year, he got a National 5 in English, and he's returned to do a fifth year with us to set his higher English. So that, that's, quite a, that's quite an achievement for the boy. Added to that, he's, uh, he's working weekends now, he's got a job, and generally speaking, he's got a job that he's going to move into. <coughs> Case study two is Jenny. Um, basically, she is a model pupil with us. She consistently wins pupil of the month. She consistently takes part in every single activity or extracurricular event that we've got. Um, she's a breath of fresh air in the school. She was a nightmare in high school. Uh, she was 
running riot in the school. Um, comes from a relatively stable home life, it has to be said. Uh, our, our biggest problem is the community offending, which is the one thing that might actually cause a, a, a placement breakdown with us. We just can't sustain this, you know, don't go, go out the weekend and get into trouble. So <coughs> we're, we're fighting very hard with this young person, but it just shows you that, that there can be a, such a difference between the young person at home or in the community or in the school. Um, case study three is David. Very high instance of community offending uh, when he was in the mainstream high school. Risk taking behaviours and gang involvement. Um, Perla excluded from his high school due to the, the disruptive behaviour and threatening uh, behaviour towards staff. When he came to us, um, he has absolutely no disruption. There has been no critical <coughs> issues. Um, he actually went from being in care back to staying with his mother. And last year, he got essentially national fives across the board. Um, he's been taken back into a local authority high school to do his sixth year, where he'll be doing two or three hires this year. Um, what a turnaround. What caused that turnaround? I think it was just someone giving him a positive routine for once. He, he, he just got into a good routine and felt, that's me. I've shaken off all of the sort of bad experiences I've had, and he reset. Um, Interesting thing about David was we, we did an inter-school um, athletics championship with a lot of other independent schools. So he ran off to the shop at the start, came back and got a roll of sausage. So he standing with roll of sausage, carry a diet coke or whatever, standing in his tracksuit bottoms and his trainers, and uh, you know he's asked, "Do you want to do the high jump?" "I'll do the high jump. That's fine." So first time he's ever done it, done the high jump, and apparently the height that he got recorded would have placed in 12th in the all-time under-16 schools championships. <laughs> and that was with our own sausage in his hand. <laughs> so the reason I'm telling you that is because some of our young people, the way they present, the histories they've had, you know, they are stigmatised. They're, they're actually frightening to a lot of people. But if you just persevere and you frame um, registration, <coughs> frame their home life, frame the community correctly, there's actually a real chance of getting achievement unlocked, uh, getting a really consistently high achievement young person, someone that can get a job, someone that can contribute to community and society as well. So that's what we try and do in Mirror Park School. Um, unfortunately, they couldn't come tonight. It would be so much better for them to talk to you. Um, they didn't want to snitch, apparently. They didn't want to tell stories, so apologies for that. But um, thank you for listening to me, and thanks for inviting me. <coughs>
Uh, but I think um, uh, the former inspector, uh, chief inspector Tony Bowen and the former inspector Mark Nicholl have been two of the pioneers, really, uh, in enabling um, an assets-based approach to community participation and development um, to come through, where they've actively gone into communities and worked alongside young people, local residents, local associations and agencies, and enabled social capital to begin to flourish, where um, higher levels of trust and reciprocity begin to emerge between the police and young people. And they also have <coughs> Victoria McMaster uh, with them today as well from Glasgow Housing Association. And the three of them are going to talk a little bit about <coughs> the creative work they've been involved in and why this kind of research is important to them in terms of policing, but also maybe in their new current careers. So thanks very much. Okay. Uh, good evening, folks. Um, Ross is right to a certain extent. Uh, we can say what we want, but maybe not as much as we want, because we still collect a police pension. <laughs> so we don't want to damage that. Um, however, in saying that, uh, I, I'm Tony Bowen, and as Ross points out, I'm a former uh, Chief Inspector in Strathclyde Police and latterly in Police Scotland. Uh, I now um, earn a living as a defence lawyer specialising in criminal law, um, so I'm doing a lot of work in uh, courts up and down the country and also specialising in prison regulations and parole processes which um, is highly enlightening, uh, especially in terms of what Ross alluded to um, around social control and the coercive nature of some of the, the positions within the prison service, um, which I may come back to, to towards the end of this piece. Um, but just, just to start off, the assets-based approach as opposed to the deficits approach, what is meant by an assets-based approach? Now, I've lived and breathed the assets-based approach for about 10 years now, and um, at the time when we first came across it, I worked in the violence reduction unit, which was all about deploying public health models to be more preventative about policing. Around the same time, the Chief Constable, Mr House, had arrived on a, a mandate to use as much enforcement-led uh, tactics as possible <coughs> and the foremost in those tactics was the, the stop search policy which um, caused no end of furore. Um, probably the, to say the least, uh, probably the, the mistake that he did make was realising that he had uh, stabilised the situation so the patient was stable and at that point um, he should have maybe taken a, a different direction and started to use more preventative type tactics along with enforcement tactics, which Mark will talk about in some more detail. But what is meant by assets-based approach? Well, for me, it's quite simple. It's how, how do you mobilise skills and talents that lie dormant within communities, especially deprived communities? How do you mobilise those skills and talents to be of benefit to the individual and the community as a whole. And th th there is a way of doing that. There is a process whereby <coughs> Mark and I um, deployed the process in locations across the west of Scotland to, to massive success, not just in terms of policing, but in terms of health and education and employment and just basic activity. Um, so that, that's the, the basic understanding of the assets-based approach. Probably the, the, the big difficulty in all of that that I found was the power shift <coughs> that um, very naturally and instinctively moved from the, the power brokers in the council and the police and the statutory organisations and started to transfer into the community. So for the first time, residents <coughs> in the community were taking big decisions about the future of where they lived. But at the same time, through the back door, we were, we were um, influencing policy around domestic abuse, 
around street violence, public space violence, violence in pubs. And I, and I suppose in a very subtle fashion, because people didn't realise we were delivering this message. So rather than turning up at a council meeting or, or, or a local community group meeting and telling people this is what you're going to do, neighbours were telling other neighbours <coughs> that this was the best option for the benefit for, of their, their community. In my uh, new role, uh, I now bore sheriffs to death about <laughs> the assets-based approach and how much of an advantage it could be in terms of community payback orders. Uh, some listen and some don't. But ju just to finish off, the, the prison service, I do a lot of work for a charity called Positive Prisons <coughs> for the Future. And I had a, a couple of cases recently which maybe highlight the, 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 the difficulties that um, those in posi positions of power uh, have got to deal with on a daily basis. The one client, very quickly, when I first met him, he was flanked by five prison officers, two at either side, one behind. He'd been convicted of a double murder uh, quite a few years ago. And I was told to sit near the exit door. And when I met him, I realised why that was. Because in my humble opinion, um, he should not be released back into the community. However, another case I've been dealing with for the past few months, a chap who was 19 <coughs> was convicted of a, a, a brutal murder. But looking into his background, he'd suffered severe trauma, sexual trauma, um, physical, emotional, psych psychological. And the person that he was then is not the person he is now. And my approach to the parole board was, you have successfully rehabilitated this man, this young man who is now reaching uh, 40 years of age. By incarcerating him for any longer, you are exacerbating his frustrations and you're only going to set him back a number of years if he is not released immediately. To my left was a, a prison officer who was over his retirement age. Um, I thought there was anything wrong with that. No. <laughs> over his retirement age and took it upon himself to object to um, the stance that I was taking uh, and the parole board were supporting. Um, but thankfully, the, the parole board have sided with ourselves <coughs> and he will be released in the next 12 months. But it just shows the coercive power um, possessed by um, people in those positions who don't have the qualifications, who don't have the knowledge, and probably don't have the, the, the thirst for that knowledge and that type of qualification. Um, so I think it ties in quite nicely with the theme of social control uh, and, and the, the stronger the empowerment, the better in rehabilitating uh, young offenders. Thanks, Tony. I'm a bit like Martin, I can speak as well, but my wife's in the same boat, so she's got to do that time out uh, <laughs> probably very quickly. Uh, it's a great honour to be invited to my first ever book launch. Uh, just finished a 30-year 30 career, 30 career in the police stuff. I smile a lot tonight just because the money went in the bank yesterday. <laughs> uh, Ross, I didn't realise when you sent me the book, the PDF and whatever else, because I live at home with two young boys with Jane, I thought it was an empty toilet roll holder. Because <laughs> <laughs> living with two boys every time I go to the toilet, I've just realised tonight it's a flare. Yes, <laughs> it's it took me a while to work that one as well. So, very quickly, probably the last 20 years I've worked in community policing and worked with local authorities in partnership, everything from community planning and you know, uh, single outcome agreements, work with government, <coughs> police headquarters a couple of times, but really working in the community. Two years ago I was lucky enough to be invited to become the Community Improvement Partnership Lead in a group called the Wheatley Group, who are an umbrella group and a number of registered social landlords of which Glasgow Housing Association for 42,000 homes in Glasgow is the biggest one. Victoria's going to talk about some of the work she does there. Uh, they funded the police for a number of years. Police went and did the stuff they did about social control and coercion, and stock search, and uh, the stuff that Mark talked about, the young people talked about. The funding was about to be up. It was going to be my legacy. I would get retired and be all right with a big pension. But my team of 15, 16 police officers would have really been returned back to local policing. So, Martin, 
Armstrong, the chief executive Wheatley Group, was a very inspirational character, had me in in October and said, Mark, uh, I don't know if I'm going to continue to fund policing in the future or not, because it's not popular with the board, because they think they should get policing as a right, because you know they contribute to the, uh, to the national income. However, what I want you to do is, don't think about a budget, don't think about uh, the confines, I want you to develop me a model that eradicates crime and antisocial behaviour completely. <laughs> and then I was like, <laughs> this was actually November, I had to do it by Christmas to continue the funding. <laughs> uh, so we kind of sat down after that, I said, I know it's not attainable, but I want you to think about that type of vision. Martin was talking about his vision with the school, so we kind of went away, scratched our heads and thought, it's kind of Einstein's definition of madness. Why do we continue to continue to do the same thing and expect a different outcome? 28, 30 years in policing, it's kind of been the same thing. We go in, as Tony says, do a bit of enforcement. It's successful when we're doing it, but it doesn't lead to anything. So Tony was my boss, inspirational character as well, but we fought like cat and dog because we had a different opinion in relation to how asset-based community development could work. I was probably more practical and uh, saying that Tony, we need to create the environment. We can't just go in and be touchy feely and do the ABCD stuff and everybody will love us and it will change. And Victoria will talk about that very thing in a minute because she is a, a, a housing officer in Govan where we've got some challenging issues. So Tony and I eventually, over uh, a couple of years, got to a position and understanding where we realised we've really got to, we're dependent on the police to keep us safe and that's the kind of strap line. And, do enforcement led policing which is very labour intensive and very difficult to do and it takes professionalism. Somebody said to me recently, policing is not a science, it's an art and you've got to work with the community to do that. So we quickly came up with a model which really has three phases. So enforcement is necessary to create an environment where the public and the partners can work in relative safety. What the, the chief exec then said to me, he says, I don't just want safe, I want calm and peaceful. It's this road which is almost like uh, the Israelites coming out of bondage in Egypt want to see the promised land. This is what this chief exec wants for social housing. It's housing with our social conscience. So we kind of developed a model which looked at social deprivation, it looked at policing and, and, and engagement and crime figures and social behaviour figures and worked out 50 problematic areas that affected about 25,000 members of the public where Wheatley had title and interest, so they were providing the social housing. The fifth top area which had massive issues with social deprivation and trending crime, so crime was going up and social behaviour was going up, public confidence was going down and for the first time ever the Wheatley Group had had a dip in public confidence figures so that was the other challenge, eradicate crime and make the public more confident about actually what we're doing. So where we had to move really quickly and it was work we had done with Ross previous and, and some other collaborations and then redusted down the work of Tony who was retiring and making a fortune as a solicitor <laughs> by that point and invited him to come back out and refresh our memories about how he actually got to do asset based community development. It's now in its infancy, Ross gives us far too much credit. There's a kind of thing in the place, you can be a pioneer and a settler, it's like the wild west, if you're a pioneer you usually get shot and taken out. So. Tony and I are old and we're pensioners and everything now and this is really our legacy, we're collaborating with Ross and some of the work that's in the book and with the young, the future, which is Victoria and our colleagues about how we give control back, it's about attainment, it's about how we raise communities and one of the things Martin said, I sound like a salesman for Wheatley but it's only because they've offered me a job <laughs> and start the start on the 2nd of October. So, uh, Yes, the future really is it is about how, how we do things. And what Martin said was we don't want to raise communities up just for them to say, I'm not living here anymore, look at the state of the place. So they've kind of worked on the physical built environments. So the next five years is about how we lift people's attainment through education, employment, training, uh, and, and all the other work. So I haven't had the time outside, but I'm going to stop now and hand, <laughs> over, <laughs> hand over to Victoria, who's really at the, at the cutting edge uh, in Harmony. There's a project started, which started on the 4th of July, so Independence Day, uh, if you're a Republican, and uh, it's called Living in Harmony. So I'll let Victoria introduce that and just tell us a wee bit about how we've inspired her, Tony, myself, Ross, and how the future's going to look, hopefully, in governance, it's a kind of two or three year project. Thank you very much.
Apologies if I stumble, Mark got me even false pretenses to come and just sit and listen and now I'm <laughs> chatting. So, um, yeah, I work as a housing officer for GHA in Govan. Um, I've worked there for a few years now. There's different parts to Govan, it's quite a large area. In the last year, I've moved to kind of, I made the fatal mistake of saying I didn't really like dealing with antisocial behaviour. So with that, I got moved to a harder area in Govan. With that came a lot of challenges. Um, both youth disorder, adult crime, the area just really looking a letdown. People are saying to me, I feel like a second class citizen living here. And I thought, we really can't have that. We really need to get things done. Issues with like partner agencies, the cleansing, things not getting picked up. And really, why would people want to live in an area like that? The main issue we have just now is youth disorder and how to kind of tackle that. I was kind of got to the stage where I was ripping my hair out and I spoke to my manager and I said, I really need extra assistance. Mark and his team in the Community Improvement Partnership have been a godsend. They've come in and with the police and that team, we know that the people do not trust the police. I'm not going to be a grass. I'm not going to come to the police. What do the police do? With those guys, it's slightly different. They've got the time to spend and build the relationships up with the youth, spending the time with the adults. They're in plain clothes. They come out with me and we try and get that relationship. I've been in this new patch for about a year and I'm starting to see improvements over the last few months where people are saying, I'm not phoning 101, but can you get your guys from the weekly team to come in and speak to me? We'll come and meet them in a cafe, we'll meet them in the office. We don't need to go to their home because they're seen as being a grass. At the moment in Govan, there's quite a lot of gang mentality. There's different gangs. We've got the Govan Young team, we've got the White team. There's all so many. Just now at the moment, I just put in lovely shiny new doors, trying to make it look nice. Two, two days in, I've smashed them. And I'm thinking, what are we going to do? So we've targeted the government team in the sense that not to give them in, bring them in and say to them, this is the road you can go down, this is what could happen. But through the weekly group, we can put on projects for you. Because it's not always about being bad, it's about being bored. And we find that there's nothing for the youth to do in the area. <coughs> so speaking to the youth and saying, what do you want in your area? We had an engagement day on the 4th of July where we had pets, free candy floss and hot dogs. It's always good to entice people out of their houses with free stuff. Uh, the police there in their plain clothes, other agencies there to try and help them say, do you want to get into college? This is the kind of thing we can do through the weekly group. Come and speak to us. That was quite a successful event and we're, we're going through the feedback just now and saying to them, well, you asked us for this, this is what we're going to provide for you. Through that, a, a company called Animalia as well, which Mark had brought to our attention, we're going to use them and bring them in for the use and say, in that kind of company, there's people who have been in gangs and been seen it, done it, wore the t-shirt. There's no point in me going out as a housing officer and saying, that's terrible what you've done, you're getting a warning for this. Really, we want people who have been there and done it to say, well, I was in a really bad place, but look at me now. I'm dead successful. This is what I've done in my life. So we're dead lucky as a housing association in GHA that we have our own police team. We have partnership agencies that are really excited to work with us. So the last thing we want is the youth causing disorder in the area and also getting a criminal you know, convictions for it. So we're saying we've got apprenticeship programmes. We can get you into that. Do you want to work? We've got mentoring programmes where we can do that. There's all different things. So now we're at the kind of early stages of getting them to trust us. We've had a few people in over the last few weeks and it's quite positive talking to their mums and dads. Do you realise? Do you need support? We can give you support. Even if you're not living in one of our tenancies, what can we do for you? So it's just kind of growing on that and things. The other point as well is when you were talking about BME groups, I'm also on the BME working group. And that's the thing, we had an apprenticeship programme where 250 apprenticeships put in for it, apprentices put in for it, but not one BME person put in. And we found that quite astonishing. So part of that group as well is us going into schools and saying, what is the blockages? How can we help you put in for these apprenticeships? And there's a whole host, whether it be environmental or whether it be office based. So it's really just trying to get early intervention and just stop any criminal, you know, having them get a conviction, sorry. So that's it really. <laughs>
and in many ways uh, they engage in collective forms of struggle, creative modes of solidarity themselves to overcome a lot of the challenges and we outline some positive illustrations of that in the book. Um, one of the final case studies in the book though um, that, we, that we focus on is um, young people's experiences in the criminal justice system and the way in which young people being referred to the adult courts for instance often has a criminogenic impact on them uh, they feel scared, they feel unsure, they, they're not aware of their rights in lots of cases, they don't even understand the language that's being used in court. Um, and we document the way in which um, when they're subjected to sanctions like curfews, restriction of liberty orders for instance, often it, it simply increases their dependency on alcohol and drugs when they're confined in their own home uh, 12 hours a day that can then lead on to further offending. We document the way in which when they are subjected to custodial sentences, uh, ultimately they end up being subjected to more violence and more criminal attitudes. Um, it's estimated, for instance, last year there were almost double the number of assaults against prisoners by other inmates in Poland than there were in Berlin. Uh, and that prison code uh, that they're exposed to ultimately just increases rather than diminishes uh, the, the criminogenic effects on them. But again, we have a great message of hope in there um, towards the end of the book. Um, through the work of um, organisations like Renfrewshire Council's Whole System Team, uh, who work intensively with young people who are referred, um, um, first and foremost to prevent them being referred to, to, to the justice system, but also where they are referred to the adult system, uh, supporting them through that, providing them with pastoral, personal support, uh, attending the court with them, demystifying it for them, making them more aware of their rights, and also writing bail reports, um, so as they are then referred away uh, from custodial sentences onto uh, community justice alternatives. And I'm delighted to be able to welcome Ronald McTaggart now, our final speaker uh, from Renfrewshire Council, to talk a little bit more about the work he's involved in. Thanks. Well, I suppose it's the equivalent of the graveyard slot, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anyway, my name's Ronald. Um, I'm a social worker. When I meet people, uh, I say I'm a social worker, the conversation usually goes, oh, very good, and then change subject. Um, if, if the conversation does go on at all, then I hopefully I, I quickly get the chance to just uh, tell people how uh, privileged a job it is that I have. Um, my team have access to young people in the most vulnerable situations that they can find themselves in, um, often very isolated, very scared. And it's an absolute privilege to support these young people um, and to help them through through the system. Ross has kind of stolen quite a lot of thunder in terms of saying what the kind of work that we do. Um, the whole system approach, I could spend all night talking about it, I won't. Uh, look it up on the Scottish Government website. It's the Scottish Government's kind of initiative for, for reducing offending behaviour under 18 year olds. And it, works with young people at all stages, very early intervention, diversion from prosecution, right up to young people who are very involved in the justice system, in secure care, in, in um, prison and that kind of thing. So it's, it, it covers a whole range of things. Uh, Ross did some uh, really interesting research just in one aspect of what uh, we do, which is our court support role. Um, so we are also have people uh, on duty every day at Paisley Sheriff Court, and if a young person is in custody, we'll go there and meet them, support them, give them advice, uh, offer them support at that point, uh, we'll provide a bail report to the courts to help them make an informed decision about what to do with the young person and hopefully reduce the use of remand where that's possible. Uh, we'll be in court with the young person and then we'll also meet them afterwards. Now the court is, a very, the court is very rich with symbolism. Um, so the young person, they, they start the morning in the basement, in the dungeon, in the cell, uh, underneath Basel Sheriff Court. If you've if you ever been down to the cells, it's a it's a noisy, chaotic place, it's a scary <coughs> place, um, lots of doors, lots of shouting. Um, so we, we meet them there and then we, we'll meet them again when they're in court. And of course the court is very symbolic, you've got the dog, you've got the sheriff, um, people wearing you know, fancy clothes, using fancy language. And you know that, that's right, the, the, you know, the sheriff is representing society. Um, and it's important that these messages are, are conveyed, but it's a scary place. And young people we work with are 
often from very traumatised backgrounds who they're not your average 16 and 17 year old. They don't have the same capacity to understand what's going on, to manage their emotions, um, to deal with authority, all those kind of things. So we support them to how to behave in court as well. Um, so we have the cell, we have the dock, and then we have the front door. And the front door in Paisley Sheriff Court is big, you know, up with pillars and everything else. Um, and th those are the three kind of key areas for us, the, the cell, the dock, and the door. Um, and we want to be with the young person at each stage of that. Obviously, obviously, they want to be walking out the front door as well. That's the best outcome for them. Uh, normally they do, sometimes, unfortunately, do end up on, on remand, but we try and kind of stop that as much as possible. Um, but being with them in, in these various stages in court is it's very powerfully symbolic for them that we're there. Um, and that builds up a huge amount of trust with the young person, but also builds up trust with other people in the court, the solicitors, the sheriff's starting to get to know uh, the team as well. And if they see us standing next to the young person saying, yeah, we'll, we'll take them out of court, we'll take them to homeless accommodation, we'll get them sorted for the night, then they have a bit more confidence in making decisions which hopefully don't involve using, using remand. So it's, it's a very powerful, uh, it's a small but powerful service that we provide, I think, in the court support service. And Ross uh, met quite a few, a few of our young people, and it's great to read uh, the chapter and to hear some of the voices. Obviously, I have the luxury of knowing who they are and uh, you know, their, their backstory. Um, but one of the reasons I love Ross's work is because he does really emphasise the voice of the young people, and I think that comes out really well in the book. Um, so that's just part of what we do, but uh, how do we know it's working? I think all, this, all the figures we suggest that youth offending is going down year on year. Uh, young people are also using less drugs and alcohol year on year. The, you might not believe it, but that is, that's actually the case. Um, but we can't we, we can be complacent, um, and I think that's one of Ross's the challenges with the book as well is really good, is that it uh, encourages us not to be complacent, because there are still things we need to work on. I think restorative justice is something which could be much better used in Scotland about mending relationships where they've been broken um, between individuals and also with communities as well. Um, internet offending is going to become the biggest, I think, issue that we'll be dealing with, even with young people now. It's becoming a massive issue. So we can never be complacent, but I think we are making huge progress, and it's great. I'm very in a very privileged position in my team, being able to work intensively with young people at that at that stage of their lives. Um, it's it's exciting at times. It's incredibly frustrating at times as well. Um, but I think what we need to do is journey with young people and allow them to fail and then be there to pick them up again. Because they will continue to fail and take risks and do things we don't like. But that's part of growing up as well. And I think part of what we do in the whole system approach is to try to allow people to grow up and take those risks without becoming too exposed to the criminal justice system. Because we know, as Rob said at the start, the earlier you're exposed to the adult justice system, the more likely you are to spend a long time in it um, and have poorer life outcomes. So we are making a difference. And I think Ross comes out in the chapter, just some of the individual relationships we've built up with young people. Um, and that, that's important and that's meaningful. And it, helps in the longer run. We don't always see instant results, but uh, we do see uh, changes lives over time. And that's, you know, it's a real privilege to do that. So, yeah, I had opportunity to read Ross's book just a couple of weeks ago. I was on holiday, so I, I probably enjoyed reading it more than maybe yeah, I would have done. <laughs> it was just after days, after days work. Um, and it was good to see, it's great to see something, I've uh, describing something you do, because it always looks better when it's written by somebody else. Um, but I think, What's really good is that I think it challenges to be as ambitious as you can be for young people. You know, I think Scotland's doing doing well, it's getting some things right, but we still have a long way to go. Um, and I think this is a really important kind of step along that way. So um, I recommend the book. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very cringy to hear that this book might even be um, regarded as holiday reading. <laughs> but uh, Mark was talking about his wife giving him signals. I think my wife's going to give me some signals in a minute if I don't hurry things along uh, a bit. But um, really all that remains for me to do is to, to thank all the, the young people in particular and they gave up their time to participate uh, in the interviews. All the practitioners that we worked with that uh, provided us with access um, to those young people and um, to their 
their um, practice and uh, uh, all the support that they've uh, provided us uh, with. And um, uh, I'd just also like to say that um, uh, uh, I'd like to thank my wife and son. Here and here. I don't think I'd get out here alive if I didn't <laughs> say that one to Karen and Alan for all their support uh, through this project. Uh, once again, as I devoted all my time to it, and even they even put up with me going to America for four and a half months earlier this year on a, on a scholarship. Uh, so thank you very much uh, to them. And um, um, the book is available uh, if you want to know more. Um, hopefully that's uh, kind of uh, sparked your interest a little bit. But I recognise uh, that the hard copy, hardback copy, the price is quite prohibitive. Maybe my mother might think about buying a copy this evening, but I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> but um, there are flyers available uh, this evening uh, that have a 20% discount. Um, if you purchase, uh, if you go online and use the code that's on the flyers, uh, you can get it for 20% off until the 5th of October. Uh, so hopefully some people might think about uh, that in the future for their organisations or their institutions. And I would just like to encourage you now uh, to uh, relax, I know I intend to do so, uh, and to thank all the speakers this evening that have given us such uh, fantastic insights uh, into the work that they're involved in. Uh, there, are, there is some wine, uh, soft drinks and food available, and just relax and enjoy the rest of the Thank you. <laughs>